anyone who knew 16-year-old Paula Pereira in Orange County, New York, couldn't help but like her. She was a lively, self-assured, carefree kid who excelled in school, loved reading as much as spending time with her close group of friends, and was active in the church youth group. Oliver Maxson said in the Times Herald record in November 2000 that Paula never complained despite being well known to have had a difficult family life. Paula's domestic issues peaked in 1981, despite her generally upbeat exterior, and she made a failed attempt at suicide by taking too many medications, according to Maxson. The students started calling Paula Tylenol on the bus as they traveled to school after that, but she didn't let it bother her. She often opted to take a hitchhike to school rather than taking the school bus. Paula's boyfriend implored her not to hitchhike because of the risks involved, but according to Maxon, she disregarded him because only nice people pick me up. The last time Paula thumbed a ride was on March 1, 1982. She left Valley Central High School early that day because she felt ill in order to rest at the home of her lover. A Cornell University student who was returning from spring break offered her a ride. She was never again seen alive. Paula's shattered remains were discovered in a desolate area off Route 211 in Wallkill, New York, 18 days later. Before being dumped into the marshy region off the side of the road, she had been viciously assaulted, sodomized, and strangled. Even though authorities searched far and low for her killer, the case went cold for nearly 20 years. Then, in 1994, the first breakthrough in the investigation happened during a broadcast BBC interview in which serial killer Michael Ross admitted guilt for two unsolved murders in New York. Michael proposed that he dispose of one of the women he killed near Wallkill, New York. The woman Michael was referring to was Paula, according to further investigation by the police. They got DNA samples from Michael to confirm their theory, which they then processed and compared to preserved evidence taken from Paula's garments. Michael was finally charged with her murder in the fall of 2000 after the DNA results matched. Paula Ross was not Michael Ross's first victim, nor would she be his last, as reported in Maxon's August 2001 piece in the Times Herald Record. Michael Ross was later quoted as telling police during an interview, as soon as I saw her, Paula, she was dead. In actuality, he would take credit for the killings of eight young women before being apprehended in 1983. The marriage of Daniel and Patricia Ross was dogged by issues from the start. Their forced union sprang from problems that started when Patricia, Pat, was a high school student and unexpectedly fell pregnant. Pat had nothing to do with the marriage or with being the wife of a chicken farmer in Brooklyn, Connecticut, but at the time she had little option, according to a 1996 story by Martha Elliott in the Connecticut Law Tribune. On July 26, 1959, Michael Ross was born. He would be the first of four kids that the unfortunate couple would have over the course of five years. Elliott asserted that there was proof that Michael's mother, who suffered from mental illness, had physically and mentally mistreated him as a child. Daniel subsequently took over as the children's primary guardian after Pat allegedly became so psychologically unstable and hostile with her children that she was taken to a mental institution at least two separate times. Elliot added that there was proof that when Michael was eight, his teenage uncle, who babysat him and had a close relationship with the child, sexually abused him before killing himself at the age of 14. Michael was able to succeed in school despite the trauma he experienced. He was particularly interested in animal science and had aspirations of one day owning a farm. Following his graduation from Killingly High School in 1977, Michael enrolled in Cornell University's College of Agriculture and Life Sciences to pursue a degree in agricultural economics. According to Catherine Davis's article in the Cornell Daily Sun in October 2000, Michael was a socially engaged student who belonged to a number of organizations when he was in school, including the Future Farmers of America and the Alpha Zeta Fraternity. In addition, he developed relationships with several attractive young co-ed, including one with whom he got engaged. Elliot, on the other hand, asserted that all of the relationships failed, and that Michael's dream of the perfect family began to be crowded by other fantasies, disturbing, violent, sexual fantasies. His fantasies soon became completely out of control. 
In his second year of college, Michael began to stalk young girls. He eventually started assaulting many of the women he stalked, giving his violent sexual impulses a new dimension. Amazingly, he managed to avoid being found for a few years. But shortly after receiving his diploma, in September 1981, he was arrested for assaulting a young adolescent female. According to Rebecca James in a Syracuse online post, Michael was employed by a Cargill Incorporated in North Carolina as a management trainee at the time of the incident. He kidnapped a 16-year-old girl while on a business trip to Illinois, dragged her into the woods, and gagged her before being stopped in his tracks by the police. Michael was placed on probation and fined $500 after being detained for wrongful restraint of the girl. The individual the police detained and later released was responsible for more than just an assault, the police were completely unaware of this. Jung Nyok Tu, 25, was found dead in May of that year in Fall Creek near Ithaca, New York, which is at the bottom of a gorge. Police initially thought she had committed suicide. They eventually understood that Jung had truly been murdered and brutally assaulted. Jung would be regarded as Michael's first known murder victim. Michael's violent fantasies had taken a terrible toll. Michael tried to kill himself after killing Jung, according to Elliot, but he didn't succeed because he was too chicken to do it. He also allegedly tried to persuade himself that he would never hurt another person again, but by that point his compulsions had gotten the better of him. Michael was an unstable individual who was about to go on a violent spree. Tammy Williams, then 17 years old, was kidnapped by Michael on January 5, 1982, as she was on her way home from the Brooklyn, Connecticut, home of her boyfriend. Not far from where she vanished, she was eventually discovered assaulted and strangled. Paula Pereira was killed about two months after Michael began his murdering spree since he was never connected to the case and hence free to carry it out. Michael struck once more in April 1982, this time in Croton, Ohio, not far from where he had secured a new position at an area egg farm. On April 2, at midnight, Michael went to the residence of a police officer who wasn't on duty and claimed that his car had broken down. When he requested a flashlight, the woman gave it to him, and Michael allegedly left to fix his car. A short while later, Michael returned and asked to use the woman's phone. James advised him to introduce himself to the woman and provide his name and place of employment. Michael attacked the woman after winning her trust. The woman fought valiantly and succeeded in frightening Michael away. She immediately contacted her co-workers, who came running to help her. The police were able to find Michael the following day after getting a description of the attacker, his name, and his place of employment. He was taken into custody right away and accused of assault. A little more than a month later, according to Michael Newton's book The Encyclopedia of Serial Killers, his parents paid his bail and sent him home to Connecticut for 16 days of psychiatric study. According to the psychiatrist assessments, Michael was indeed experiencing psychological issues, which he attributed to his parents' 1981 divorce. Surprisingly, despite the fact that he had a criminal history that included two sexual offenses, not much was done to keep him under ongoing mental monitoring or police scrutiny. Michael was thus free to continue his murderous rampage. According to Newton, Deborah Taylor, then 23 years old, and her husband ran out of petrol on June 15, 1982, close to Danielson, Connecticut, and split up to hunt for a gas station. Michael kidnapped her as she was crossing the street and then assaulted, beat, and strangled her. A jogger discovered her skeletal bones about four months later, according to Newton. Although he would subsequently be connected to the case, Michael was first not suspected. Michael finally made an appearance in an Ohio court in August 1982 to answer for beating the pregnant policewoman. He entered a guilty plea during the hearings, paid a $1,000 fine, and spent four months in jail before being released on probation. According to James, the probation report suggested he make better use of his free time, perhaps by taking classes, starting a jogging program, or learning to fly, in the hopes that the pursuits might deter his aggressive conduct. The suggestion was absurd and disturbing. It is easy to understand why such behavior would not discourage a violent serial offender, if at all. After finishing his probation, 
Michael returned to Connecticut and started selling insurance door-to-door. He lied about his criminal history when applying for the job, which helped him get it. He probably saw his next victim while scouting out possible customers. Robin Stavinsky, 19, vanished while traveling in Norwich, Connecticut, on November 19, 1983. A week later, according to Newton, joggers discovered her remains close to a neighborhood hospital. She'd been both assaulted and choked. Due to the striking similarities between the cases at the time of the discovery, detectives working the case were able to connect Stavinsky's murder to those of Tammy Williams and Deborah Taylor. The majority of the victims were about the same height, sodomized, discovered face down, and strangled. The police had little leads at the time regarding the identity of the perpetrator, despite the fact that it was becoming increasingly obvious to them that a serial killer was among them. They scrambled to identify the serial killer using the evidence collected from the crime places. Michael eventually committed his first double homicide on Easter Sunday 1984. April Brunais and Leslie Shelley, two 14-year-old friends from Griswold, Connecticut, were on their way to a friend's house after leaving the movies when Michelle abducted them. When the girls' bodies were eventually discovered, it was evident that both had been viciously assaulted and killed in a way akin to how Michael had killed his earlier victims. Michael claimed his seventh murder victim two months later. Wendy Baribolt, a 17-year-old native of Lisbon, Connecticut, was kidnapped in broad daylight on June 13, 1984. Wendy was supposedly last seen alive traveling down State Highway 12 on her way to a convenience shop, according to witnesses. A few days later, her remains were discovered. Wendy had been assaulted and strangled like Michael's other victims. On the day she vanished, witnesses claimed they noticed a thin white man with glasses driving a blue, late model Toyota following her, unlike the prior murder instances, James reported. The break that the detectives were waiting for materialized. Wendy's murder case lead investigator was Detective Michael Mychik, who also worked on the Tammy Williams investigation. Mychik followed the car that the eyewitnesses said they had seen to start his inquiry. Elliot reported that Mychik printed out a list of 3,600 nearby blue Toyotas that fit the description. Unsurprisingly, Michael Ross was the first name on the list he saw on June 28, 1984. Mychik was immediately skeptical of the young man during the interview. Elliot said that Mychik referred to the experience as a roller coaster ride because every time he was about to leave the flat, Michael would drop him a crumb that would make him think that he should ask more questions, according to Elliot. Michael eventually confessed to some of his misdeeds after becoming unable to keep his horrifying secrets any longer. He initially only confessed to killing Wendy Baribold when he spoke to Mychik, but later, while being held by the police, he also admitted to killing April Brunais, Leslie Shelley, Tammy Williams, Deborah Taylor, and Robin Stravinsky. Years later, he would take responsibility for the murders of Paula Pereira and Jung Myok Tu. Michael's trial for the deaths of Tammy Williams and Deborah Taylor began in July 1987. He admitted to killing them and was given a 120-year maximum sentence. He was found guilty of killing Wendy Baribolt, April Brunais, Leslie Shelley, and Robin Stravinsky the month after his trial. Two life sentences and six death sentences were all that were given to him. Michael became irate both during and after the trials because he believed that the judge and jury were biased and that some of the witnesses' testimony was wildly false. But the thing that probably irritated him the most was that he thought the court had overlooked his purported mental disorder. Michael claimed that the judge's decision to not allow his psychiatrist, Dr. Robert Miller, to testify was the clearest example of this. The defense team argued that the jury would have been more forgiving during the penalty phase if Dr. Miller had been permitted to present his testimony regarding Michael's psychological state. Furthermore, his mental illness might have even been viewed as a mitigating circumstance that would have prevented him from receiving the death penalty. Michael lodged a broad list of grievances and requested a new trial from the state in protest. Elliot said that the Judicial Review Council and the Statewide Grievance Committee rejected his concerns after reviewing his case. Michael, though, persisted through the appeals procedure, and eventually the Supreme Court heard his case. 
As reported by Richard Biegenwald in a serial killer hit list article from 2000, the Connecticut State Supreme Court upheld Michael's murder convictions in July 1994 but overturned the death sentences, finding that the original trial judge excluded evidence that might have helped Ross prove he suffered from a mental illness or defect. The court consequently mandated a new punishment hearing, which would be set back by several years. Meanwhile, Michael struggled with his mental health issues and considered suicide. Michael's alleged mental instability was first mentioned when he was a little youngster. In a 1992 Police Magazine article, Karen Clark was quoted as saying that Michael had fantasies about women as a little boy, he had fantasies about bringing them to a special underground place, hiding them and keeping them to love him. She was also quoted as saying as a teenager, he molested several little neighborhood girls. As an adult his fantasies grew more sexual and progressively more violent. It's also been proposed that his aggressive demeanor was really brought on by a chemical imbalance in the brain. The most likely scenario is that both of the contributing components were present. Michael frequently portrayed his violent sexual cravings in his writings from prison as a separate, uncontrollable monster that would suddenly take over without warning and drive him to act in ways he knew were wrong. In a 1998 essay titled It's Time for Me to Die, an inside look at death row, he claimed that because his impulses were constant, it was like living with an obnoxious roommate from which he could never get away. He went on to say that he would frequently experience orgasmic pleasure while acting out his fantasies, but that he would also later be disgusted by the exact same thoughts, adding that he felt such a sense of loathing and self-hatred that he frequently yearned for death to free him from his mental torment. In his book The Psychopathic Mind, Origins, Dynamics, and Treatment, Dr. J. Reed Malloy defined sexual sadism as the conscious experience of pleasurable sexual arousal through the infliction of physical or emotional pain, which is characteristic of most sexual psychopaths. Most of the psychiatrists who treated Michael made this diagnosis. The repetitive thoughts, urges and fantasies of the degradation, assault and murder of women, which Michael claimed he couldn't get out of his head, were repeatedly reduced by his psychiatrists. Michael claimed that the feminine contraceptives Depo-Provera helped to drop his testosterone levels to below prepubescent levels, further resulting in a major reduction in his violent cravings and fantasies. This, in turn, helped to alleviate some of his symptoms. However, the comfort was just momentary. The hormones directly caused Michael's liver troubles, which forced him to stop taking his prescription. He soon lamented that the obnoxious sexual desires had returned. Michael was given an alternate method of female contraception a little over a year later, which helped him to regain control over his sadistic urges to assault women. According to legend, Michael's prescription gave him the clarity he needed to understand the full gravity of his heinous deeds. He claimed that he could only vaguely recall the specifics of the murders, but he did start to understand some of the suffering he caused the victims' families. In his article, he said that their suffering tormented him, but he also understood that there was nothing he could do to make up for what he had done. As a result, Michael made the decision to volunteer for death rather than let his victims' families suffer in silence. His contentious choice would elicit a range of emotions, including fury and relief, and briefly upend the institution, which was unaccustomed to criminals requesting state-assisted suicide. Michael worked with state prosecutors for the greater part of four years to avoid a hearing on a new punishment and to reach an agreement to go straight to the execution chamber. Michael and state attorney C. signed a ten-page death pact on March 11, 1998. Robert Sotti begged the court to speed his death while admitting his deeds were abhorrent and terrible. Michael wanted to avoid a second punishment hearing, which the Superior Court judge had chosen to annul because it was unconstitutional and unsettling. The jury selection portion of the retrial's penalty phase was slated to start in April 1999. Michael supposedly had a change of heart and decided he did not want to be executed the same month, according to Biegenwald. The defense team's original objective was to demonstrate that Michael's mental illness was a mitigating circumstance that would prevent him from receiving the death penalty. In order to support the death penalty, the prosecution team planned to prove the existence of so-called aggravating factors, according to Hartford, Connecticut's WTNH News Channel 8. 
before either side could make their case, they would have to wait for a while. Michael's penalty hearing ultimately began about ten months after jury selection and a great deal of legal wrangling. The prosecution's case was presented over the course of three days, starting with the evidence of the victim's loved ones and the police investigators, and concluding with a videotaped BBC interview in which Michael discussed the suffering of his victims. The job for the defense team to persuade the jury was made much more difficult by their persuasive arguments and the evidence of the victims' families. Although they had their work cut out for them, the defense was also able to make a compelling case. Dr. Stanley Kapuczynski, Michael's prison psychiatrist, testified before the jury, claiming that his patient had sexual sadism and that medication could treat its symptoms. His comments backed up the defense's claim that Michael's mental instability was what ultimately led to his murderous spree. On the witness stand, Michael's father also begged for his son's life. According to a March 2000 article by WTNH, Daniel Ross stated that he felt it would be a mistake to execute Michael Ross because he is a biological specimen that might ultimately provide insightful data about the psychopathology of a serial killer. Michael's aunt also spoke in court on his behalf and pleaded for the death penalty to be avoided. Sam Reese Shepard, the son of Dr. Sam Shepard, who was found guilty of killing his mother in Ohio in 1954, was perhaps one of the most surprising witnesses to take the witness stand in Michael's defense. According to a WTNH piece, Sam openly criticized the death sentence throughout his testimony and argued that Michael would be better off dead than contributing to research. The introduction of Dr. Miller's testimony, which was excluded from Michael's initial trial, was the defense's turning point, nevertheless. Thirteen years ago, in a letter to the court, Dr. Miller claimed that Michael's mental state was a mitigating circumstance that ought to affect the severity of the punishment imposed on his client. The defense presented their closing statements after introducing one of their most significant pieces of evidence, and then they rested their case in the hopes that the jury would concur with Dr. Miller's findings. The Superior Court jury, which was composed of nine men and three women, reached a verdict following nine days of discussion. On April 6, 2000, Michael was sentenced to death once more for the savage killings of Leslie Shelley, Robin Stavinsky, Wendy Barabalt, and April Bruneis. It had taken the state a total of 16 years since Michael's arrest to secure a death sentence against him and they were determined to make it stick this time, according to Diane Scarponi in an April 2000 article. Michael, she wrote, stood impassively as the verdicts were read while the families of the victims wept or sat with bowed heads. Michael will be one of the first people to be executed in the state of Connecticut since 1960 if the state has its way. Michael was transferred from his death row prison cell in Connecticut to the Sullivan County Maximum Security Prison in Fallsburg, New York, in August 2001, while his death sentence was under appeal. He was moved to Orange County so that he might be charged with assaulting and killing Paula Pereira. In front of Judge Nicholas de Rosa on September 24, 2001, Michael entered a guilty plea to the counts of first-degree murder. He was given an 8-25 to year prison term for killing Paula viciously the next month. Unexpectedly, Michael appeared relieved when the verdict was announced and was quoted as saying, I regret that this has taken so long to be taken care of, according to Timothy O'Connor of the Times Herald Record. Michael was able to avoid prosecution for the 1981 assault and murder of Jung Nyok Tu. James cited Tompkins County District Attorney George Denties as saying that since Michael had already received a death sentence in Connecticut, it was futile to try to convict him for her homicide. In addition, Jung's family in Vietnam has no desire to pursue the matter and would rather avoid experiencing the suffering that has broken their family apart once more. Despite Michael's attorney's several appeals, the Connecticut Supreme Court decided to affirm his earlier death sentence in May 2004. An execution date had been scheduled for January 26, 2005 in the following October. Michael had made the decision to give up his 18-year appeals process and accept his fate. Finally, when Connecticut carried out its first execution in 45 years on May 13, 2005, it finally complied with Michael Ross' request. According to the New York Times, 
Michael Bruce Ross chose to forego further appeals in defiance of public defenders and others who wanted to save him. Ross convinced judges he was competent, smirked at psychiatrists who said he was suicidal, and frequently seemed exasperated by his inability to reshape his image. Michael Ross did not commit suicide, according to defense lawyer T.R. Paulding, who supported Ross's requests. It was a courageous choice, the speaker said. Nine relatives of his victims were present as Michael Ross received his lethal injection at the Osborne Correctional Facility in Summers, Connecticut. Ross decided against offering a concluding speech, 